All right, everybody, we're live. <laughs> There's nobody here, which I'm not surprised about. Uh, I am on the road, and welcome to another episode of Gearbox. And today we'll see if anybody, we usually have people here, but right now it looks pretty darn quiet. So um, I guess I'll just start talking. Wait, Hangouts on Air is going away later this year for quick streaming. Try YouTube.com webcam. Wow. So things are changing. What's up, Ryan? How you doing, man? Uh, so I don't know how many people are here. Maybe it's just because I need to refresh my page. But um, we'll see how that all goes and what's happening. But welcome to um, another episode of Gearbox. And I'm on the road, and this is kind of a strange one because I am pre-going out to the East Coast to um, Atlanta on Sunday for about 10 days for production. What's up, Masterstroke Media? Um, but I had a trip that was pre-planned before this particular trip uh, for the production, which is kind of a vacation, but I couldn't change it. A good friend of mine uh, has a big birthday that is coming up, and this was planned out with uh, my wife and I. So we are um, we're in Las Vegas which is maybe not the place I want to go all of the time. And I've been here already two times. So it's my third time this year already. Um, the other two times were for work, but I figure I got to get some work in here. So I'll do a gearbox. And we also have Cameron Flask coming up later on today. I'm excited about that episode, by the way, because that episode is going to be our least favorite gear. So um, who knows what's going to happen there between myself Ben Barden and Mr. Caleb Pike. Um, hopefully everybody can see me. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And it's half decent in terms of quality of picture. Uh, I'm staying at the Cosmopolitan. So I'm in a semi-swanky room here. And I'm here for a couple of nights. And then I'm moving to another hotel. That's just the way it goes sometimes. What's up, Henrik? Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things today, and then, of course, on the chat, anything is fair game in terms of questions related to production and that kind of stuff. Um, I do want to just say right off the bat, and this is really only because of the production and the nature of the production that I have next week, I'm producing a, an educational course. I'm not the talent in there, uh, so I'm going in and producing and directing that. And again, it's going to be, uh, it's about a 10-day, uh, you know, door-to-door -door project for me. What's up, Bill? But I am going to be heavy into the production on that next Wednesday. So Wednesday, what is that, the 26th, I will be completely out of commission. So we're not doing a gearbox, unfortunately, and we're not doing a camera and flask. But for the foreseeable future after next Wednesday, I don't see any scheduling conflicts. So I think we'll be back on track a week later, um, as far as I can tell. Though I have to hold on, I'm just going to take a look at that calendar and see if we've got one more strange thing in our way. No, we're good. Wednesday, July 3rd. Uh, so July 4th is usually a no, no, and that's like family and hanging out and stuff like that. So yeah, there it is. Hey David, what's going on? So, Hey, bad karma. I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, I'm in Vegas. I'm kind of on a semi vacation though. I'm prepping for a big job in Atlanta and, uh, make it a double special. Got to, uh, go to work. Just want to say hi. Hey Dan, uh, make sure you come back for Cameron Flask later on today. We're going to be doing our least favorite gear. So here we are, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about being on the road. I'm going to talk about a new bag that I've just started to use. I'm going to talk about some of the equipment that I normally have with me when I do this kind of stuff. And again, uh, fair game in terms of questions and things like that on the chat. Now, the first thing that I always take with me, just so that you know, is this right here, which is this Netgear, um, you know, MiFi or portable Wi-Fi unit. And this is the lifesaver here. I'm on AT&T. I generally get good service in this country. And this is the key to the castle for me 
being able to not only do work on the road, that's usually pretty easy with hotel Wi-Fi, uh, but generally when it comes to download speeds, it's okay. Upload speeds are abysmal, so having this little unit here is great. What's up, Filmmaker Media? Um, other stuff that I'm carrying, well, really, that's where we get into the bag here. And just so that you know, from a um, from a production standpoint, <laughs> I I didn't have enough room uh, for this trip, and I didn't want to like gack it out in terms of gear, so I didn't bring a tripod. And my portable tripod, which I'll have next week when I go to Atlanta, is actually being used by a friend of mine. And so I'm getting that back, and um, and so I'll be able to use that if I need to do something. Of course, as I said, though, we're not doing Cameron Flask or Gearbox just next Wednesday. So let me uh, actually switch over here and share something with you so you can see a couple of pictures. I'm going to go to an application window, which I think I'm going to do correctly. I'm going to share that. And then can everybody see that? I think you can. So, so basically, if you just take a look at this, this is kind of what my setup is like today because I don't have a tripod. So um, just think of me sitting inside of that chair right there or on that chair. And there's the Tenba Axis 20L, a 20 liter bag. There's the little X-T3. And just so you can get a slightly better view of what I'm doing here, those are two garbage cans sitting on two large coffee table books to get the height that I need on the X-T3, and that's a little Focus 5-inch, and then that's basically what I'm looking at right now. And then not a lot of light in this room. It's very moody in the Cosmopolitan, so what they... Um, <laughs> It's just ridiculous. And everything's smart. And, and there's uh, light fixtures that you can't really change the output of, seriously. So what I've done in order to get some exposure here is I've used the television to my right. And that's essentially my key. Um, lots of different color temperatures going on. I just said, screw it. I just set the camera to auto white balance. I'm not moving. And basically... What I did is I just found the channel. This is the checkout channel, which is as even as possible in terms of light so that I could have a consistent, relatively consistent exposure. And that's the ridiculousness of what I've done here. But check this out. That's my freaking view. That is the best view I have ever had uh, out of a hotel room window in Las Vegas. And I've had some pretty cool ones. But this is uh, pretty nice. That's the Bellagio. So this evening we'll be seeing the fountains go off. Um, we got back too late last night to see that happening. And apparently there's some new thing that's happening with the Paris, with the Eiffel Tower. And then all the way in the distance there, you'll see Trump Tower. And that just proves that we are all living in 1985 version of Back to the Future. The 1985 Biff of Back to the Future is where we are right now. Uh, so there you go again, that's the sort of setup. That's the garbage cans, one on top of the other to get the height. There's my key light, which is just basically the television. And um, that's what I got for you in terms of that. So there you go, stop sharing and back to me. And then let's see what we've got. I see there's a couple of comments here. Uh, Gerald finally made it to live gearbox. Uh, gearbox, how's it going? Uh, do I have a media pass to get discount for your gear when you fly? I don't. Um, I could get one actually because I am media when I go to shows, so that wouldn't be a problem. And I do when I go to NAB get a media pass, so I'm legit that way. Um, you can definitely save on gear. Most of the time, I take the the idea of small to no crew production. So what I'll do is I will usually check no more than two bags and at most three. And it all depends on the airline and who you're flying, but the media pass will get you a discount on um, on all of your bags, especially when you go, pardon me, past two bags. And then I actually have um, status with Alaska, so I get two bags for free when I travel with them. What's up, Andres? Uh, Ryan, Alex, uh, there you go. Great idea. Using TV as a key. Hey, what are you going to do? Yeah, I'm a high roller. You'll see how much I'm going to put down on the table. That'll never happen. Um, good. All right, so I got some coffee. 
There might be some drinking later on. There definitely will be with Cameron Flask. And let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, this bag, and we'll talk about some of the kit that I travel with, and it's different for every job. And as I said, next week, uh, which is Wednesday the 26th, I will be off for one week because of a big production that I'm doing in Atlanta. Uh, so here we go. So this is the Axis uh, 20L bag from Tenba. And one of the challenges that I have is that I don't like to use backpacks as much as I used to, mainly because of my neck and stuff. Um, so I have these great shootout backpacks. They're 24 liters and they hold everything under the sun and they have these great side pockets and they have you know, a place for your laptop and everything else, but it's just a little too unwieldy. And then there's also the 14 liter and 16 liter bags from Tenba, which, um, which I absolutely love, but I can't actually put a laptop in there. So I'm forced to put that into a Roadie 21 roller from Tenba. So um, I decided to check this bag out. So basically what you have is you have this pack here and in the front, these straps here can be configured any way you want. And then underneath, and I'm just going to open it up here, there's a zippered compartment. And you can take that out and you can attach a tripod here. And then the bottom of the tripod will essentially sit inside of that. That can get a little bit crazy in terms of, you know, in your overhead just because it gets a little bulky. But I think it's great. Uh, Bad Karma, it's about, yeah, it's about 9-11 right now. Um, so that's the front here. And then there's also a pocket right here. This is really your main other pocket in the bag. So you've got a place for cards. You've got a place for other stuff. And it's a pretty deep pocket right here. So what I'm keeping inside of here is I'm keeping a Kindle. I've got sunglasses in here. I do keep my headphones in here normally. Um, it seems to be a good place for that. And then in terms of other storage that goes beyond the main compartment, if you look right here, and I'm just uh, referring to the screen here so I can see what you guys are seeing, there's a zippered pocket here where you can put various things. So this might be good for len lens cleaning cloths and media cards and all that kind of stuff that you need to get to. And then the rest of the bag is all about accessing it multiple ways. You can access the bag from the top here into the main compartment. You can access the bag over here on the side. So this will actually get into the main compartment if you wanted to, let's say, place a camera system inside of here. Then you could go ahead and do that. And then on this side, there is actually one other storage place, which is a side pocket. So if you had a little Joby or something like that, you could actually put that in there, bottle of water, whatever. Hopefully my mic is not making too much noise, guys. I apologize. That's the one I have, uh, the Rody Hybrid 21, and it's a beast. Yeah, this is the Axis 20L, um, and I love the Rody, the rolling one. Um, okay, good. So let's take a look at this. And then on the back, uh, very breathable. This is a full-on real deal backpack in terms of having all of the shoulder straps and then the waist strap uh, and then the mid strap over here. Um, so you have all of those components here. The only thing that I wish that this bag had on the back was a Velcro double uh, strap here so that I could put this onto another rolling case or a suitcase. So I'm going to talk to Peter at uh, Tenba about that and see if that's something that could be added in the future. Thank you, We Are Cinema, for the heads up on the sound. Okay, so then what you have is you have the main compartment, which, again, I showed you you can get to multiple different ways. And this is the nice part about this. If you leave your zippers at the top, um, let me just get those set up here. So if you leave your zippers at the top, you can actually access, um, which I'll show you in a second, the laptop area, which is right here. So this will fit a full 15.4 inch uh, MacBook Pro and some papers if you're working on a breakdown of the shot list for a project. And then over here on the other side, um, the bag actually comes with lots and lots of dividers. And I sometimes use dividers and I sometimes don't. They're all ripped out right now, but they are really, really nice. And there's a bag cover for rain and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm just going to basically start to show you some of the little pouches that I have inside of 
the bag so you can see that. And it's very deep. Uh, my Sennheiser HD 25s, again, those sometimes sit in the front pocket or have been sitting inside of the front pocket. Um, I also put inside of the main compartment here um, the, you know, <clears throat> the power supply for my MacBook Pro. And then it's all about pouches for me most of the time. So this is um, these little cube pouches that I get from Sharper Image or stores like Marshalls. And they usually come in three packs of different sizes, so a small, medium, and large. And then I just put like items into these pouches and you can actually see through them so you can see what's in there. And these are all my cables. So this is everything for uh, USB and charging phones and anything having to do with general devices that are outside of camera equipment. Um, this second pouch is being used currently for a little audio pouch here, which is also from Tenba which is holding all of my little wireless lofts and mics and all of that stuff. And then I'm also rocking the uh, cost little headphones that I love so much, the Porta headphones. And then inside of this pouch also is where I store along with the power supply and the charging cable, the Netgear uh, wireless unit, the little portable Wi-Fi unit. So that's what's sitting in there today it changes all of the time and then let's see what else i have i'm just going to start to go through these uh, this is the small version of those cubes and i have two usb-c hard drives inside of here so that i have some photos that i buy the one uh by the one by the way i'm actually um starting to transition now and i'm using capture one for uh, my my photos I used to be an Aperture user, and I've got to find a different solution. And I'm really digging Capture One, especially for Fujifilm. And they also have a standalone product for Sony, uh, which is free. And you can pretty much do most of the stuff that you want to do until you start to get into the need for layers and cloning and all of that fun stuff. And then you drop 110 bucks and you buy the full version which is something I'm about to do. Uh, okay, so there's those pouches, so those three. Um, I've got another cool pouch. This is also from Tenba that they make in different sizes, and um, this is the prototype, actually, before these were even made, and now I have other ones that are longer, and they're cool because they're padded, but they have this clear portion on the window or it's a little window, and then you can actually see what gear is inside of there. So these little zippered pouches, and I dig those very much. Um, kind of an upgrade from the Porta Brace ones I used to and still use, but those are black and you can't see what's inside of there, so you have to label them up with some white gaff or something like that. Um, another little Tenba pouch. Um, you can see this, this one's great. It's got this little web side pocket. It's got a back pocket right here, another side pocket. It's got little pockets in the front. Um, I love that kind of stuff. It just makes me very happy. Another little zippered pocket here. And what's going inside of here? Well, it's my X-T3. So I put the X-T3 in here with a couple of NPF batteries. Um, I actually put the Focus 5 monitor inside of this and it actually fits inside of this little padded case. So inside of here, and let's uh, stop that. That's a reminder for my production in Atlanta. And then I've got one of these little small rake handles, which I can put onto the cold shoe. It's actually a hot shoe on the X-T3. And I can actually put a monitor and, uh, you know, I can actually, oh, the wireless go, which I'm using right now from Rode. And I can put that right on there in terms of the receiver. This is the transmitter right here. And that's basically what I'm dealing with. Um, kangaroos would love this episode. I don't know what that, yeah. Uh, everything I do is like a magic carpet bag. Um, and then lastly, besides the uh, camera, audio kit, the laptop, all of the other gack that's inside of this bag, I have one of these. And this is also made by Tenba. It's a semi-hard uh, case on the sides and then it's clear in the front so you can see exactly what's inside of here and this is my other camera stuff so I change what's inside of this particular case um, Tenba makes these little battery pouches 
And inside of here right now, I have four of the, they're called Reload. This is the Reload Battery 2. And inside of here, I have four Fujifilm batteries. So when I swap out and I go, um, you know, to use the camera just sort of in a normal mode, and I'm noticing, oh, Fujijabaga. I forgot my camera strap. I forgot it because I uh, took one of my cases out for this particular trip, which is going to go with me to Atlanta. And I usually always have the camera strap for the X-T3 inside of that case. It's essentially a slightly larger version of this. And inside of it is normally all of this stuff. And then the bottom is the uh, quick release camera strap. But here you go, four batteries. So I can use this without the focus monitor, which is actually what's powering it. Um, any issues with the MPF batteries, uh, batteries in my carry-on? Alex, no issues at all. Um, if you want to just be really kosher about the whole thing, take them and put them into small Ziploc bags when you put them in your case. I usually put them in a roller and they're inside like the little groove where, um, I don't know, I use the groove in my 10 bar roller for all of my batteries. So I usually travel with eight to 12 of those, um, on this particular trip, just two, cause I'm only here for a few days going back and then getting all my equipment and heading out to Atlanta. But I've got these batteries for still photography. Um, I've got a little ND filter and a cleaning cloth inside of here for the uh, 35 millimeter prime that I'm using right now. And then this is the kit lens for the X-T3. This is the 18 to 55, which has IS. Probably one of the best um, kit lenses on the market. It's a 2A to a 4, so it's not a constant aperture, but it's pretty cool. A uh, little battery charger for the Fujifilm batteries. So I'm just bringing one. They're all charged up anyway. I've got my little 27 millimeter pancake, that 2.8 lens, which I love. And a uh, little blower here, Giotto blower, and a variable ND filter, which is really important if I'm using that 18 to 55 um, for video, especially less so for photography. Always, whoa. Mother of all mothers. I try to carry a, uh, a back and a body cap with me for the camera systems that I am using. So uh, that's what I've got inside of here. <clears throat> and that all neatly goes into this little pouch. It's a beautiful thing. And then that goes into the bag. And the bag's not overstuffed. So a 20 liter backpack like this can fit a whole lot of crap. The only, again, adjustment that I made, which is a bummer that I forgot the camera strap, is moving this uh, over to here. So this will just barely fit maybe with the Focus 5 here, but my larger um, version of this for the camera and all the GAC, I can actually put this right in there. So that's why I don't have that camera strap. Uh, Andre says, I just changed to using the blind spot power junkie for my whole setup. So now I only uh, carry NPF and uh, the LPE6s and love it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I actually think it's really good to do the best you can to settle on a singular battery solution. Uh, check out some of Caleb's stuff on his channel. He's got some amazing solutions for powering. And of course, one of the things that we're seeing now is powering cameras with USB-C based batteries. And there are companies like Small Rig coming out with mounting solutions for those. So you basically have a little power brick and then you go USB-C into the camera system. And I think that that's a great option as well. Similarly to taking um, your camera mount, you know, for your tripods and all your other camera support and settling on something, um, it's usually a good idea to settle on a singular battery solution. So, for instance, when I do mirrorless now, it's all Arca Swiss across the boards. I'm not swapping between Arca Swiss and Monfrotto. And then when I get into my bigger camera systems, then I'm trying to settle into one camera system. I mean, sorry, one camera mounting solution across the boards for a particular project. I'm trying to match my Evo 1 S1 and GH5S, good luck, <laughs> via color checker passport using non-log Pick profile, suggestions for best way to do this. I've got a Ninja 5 and Shogun Inferno to hopefully help. 
Um, so Ryan, this is sort of the Pandora's box. And I will say off the bat that I'm not the color guy. That is not where my area is. Um, you know, I try to get stuff in camera. I try to match cameras as much as I can on production. So I don't have to deal with those issues. Um, generally you want to roll on those charts so you can bring up a vector scope and see how far off they are. And you're obviously using non-log footage, um, which you're either getting from somebody or you were forced to use three different camera systems. So that's tricky because even though those are all Panasonic or Panty systems, um, they all use distinctly different sensors, pardon me, to my knowledge. Um, so you're dealing with different sensors, which all react differently. And so that's where it's getting tricky. So yes, rolling on the, but I don't know, it, via a color checker passport. So you you do have footage that way. I mean, you've got to bring up those scopes. Um, one of the things that I would do is there's a great episode that Caleb Pike on DSLR Video Shooter did about a month, month and a half ago, where he talks about using a chart and actually essentially white balancing, getting everything to be in about the same ballpark. And if you follow that, Ryan, and you take the data you have on your charts, I think you'll start to get pretty close in terms of at least getting those cameras to match better than they are right out of the box. Um, so I would definitely check that out. Um, so what I would do, Ryan, is I would go in there and I would try to settle on some things because it sounds like you've decided not to shoot log and just get in there and set things to, um, some sort of gamma that's giving you a little bit more roll off, but protecting, you know, and protecting your highlights and go Rec 709, and I would just get them all up and see if you can feed them to something that's showing you the vector scope live with the chart in the frame. And that will start to show you the differences in terms of the way your color is being interpreted by the camera. The best thing in the world would be to, um, you're not gonna have three cameras hooked up to three different monitors with vector scopes, most likely. So you can either roll on footage on all of them, bring them in and see where they are. If you want to kind of do it live, you can take one monitor, set up a camera, um, plug it in, look at the vector scope with a chip chart in the frame, and then take a photograph of that and see where your colors are falling in terms of the vector scope. And then plug in the next camera look at that, take a photograph of it, next camera, so on and so forth, and start to look at the differences. And then at that point in time, um, remember that gamma is just um, luminance levels. That's just blacks to whites. What we care about is gamut. We care about how the color is being interpreted. And those are the ones that you want to start to cycle through for all three of those cameras and find if there are a uh, gamut uh, you know, basically color space settings in the camera system that are uh, closer to each other for each of the cameras where each of your colors are falling in a similar place on the vector scope. And what you do is you'd go in there and figure out what those are for each three of your cameras and then set those to their defaults. And even if they're not absolutely perfect, you're seeing gamut that is similar in terms of where colors are falling for all three of the cameras. And then as long as you roll on your chip chart in, uh, in production, then what you can do is when you get into post, you could again, look at that tutorial from Caleb where he brings a chart up and he's, you know, basically matching up the camera systems and does that stuff. Um, so I hope that helps. I mean, just things to think about. It's not necessarily the only workflow but it might be one way that I would approach doing that. Um, do I have any recommendations for storing media assets, project files? I have been saving to portable drives, uh, but it's hard to organize them. I mean, I have a RAID set up right now for, um, for a, a bigger project that we're doing for a client. I think Caleb's probably a better person to ask about that. Uh, people are using, um, what is it called, Backblaze or something? Uh, and I haven't gotten into that yet. But um, there you go. Uh, S1 doesn't have log just yet, so trying to have a bait. Oh, I got it, Ryan. Yeah, 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 I got you. Um, <clears throat> so what else do we have? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm basically doing multiple backups and I'm saving cards on the project until I absolutely have everything backed up to multiple places. Uh, but I am a very much a portable drive person because of the type of production that I do. And, and then back at the home base uh, arrayed. And then I also have a caddy <clears throat> where I can put in larger, um, basically bare drives. And I have 12 terabyte ones right now. On the job that we're doing in Atlanta, I have six um, four terabyte drives. So what we'll do is we will back up our C200s. Uh, we're shooting with three C200s uh, in rotation. So there's one A camera that will either be on a Dana Dolly or it'll be on a Ronin S uh, steady cam rig. And then the second camera, B camera, will be on sticks generally uh, with a longer lens. So we're basically taking that and also the footage from the production, which will be a 1DX uh, Mark II, some C200, <clears throat> same C200, uh, C200, but going on to a Movi. And, and then we'll also have photographs and we'll have a sound recorders for three of the six days of production. Um, so what else? Um, oh, so what we're doing is at six drives and we just make sure it's sort of like, you know, a general math thing, how much are we shooting? And I figured that's probably going to cover us. And then I have a 10 terabyte drive, <clears throat> which is not a portable bus powered one, which is probably going to be the drive that we send all of the footage out for, for this course. Um, that's what I got for you. So any other questions besides that? Um, <clears throat> in terms of getting into here, though, it looks like Hangouts on Air is going away. At the moment, I am just going HDMI to a cam link to a little adapter to get into USB into my computer system. So that's how we're getting this. Um, shooting at a relatively high ISO because of this situation that I have here but it seems to be working out pretty well. What's the most challenging gear to pack, it, pack when you travel? Uh, stands. I mean, stands are the biggest, stands and tripods are the biggest pain in the ass for sure when you are traveling. And that's why myself and so many people like to source those locally. Uh, I'm going out to Atlanta and I have tripod systems and every single extra piece of luggage that you check is going to cost that much more, even if you have a press rate or press pass. And sometimes it's less expensive or just a little bit more expensive to rent that gear when you get to the other side. But without all of that hassle of having two or three or four extra bags to get that stuff there. So for the Atlanta job, um, I have a local gaffer, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize, who is... Um, Coming in, he has a three ton and he has a one ton. The one ton vehicles are generally uh, smaller, like the NV series uh, 2,500 from Nissan. And that'll be like a, a, a one ton truck. And then, uh, Alex, I'm actually going to answer that question about sourcing lights. Um, and then the three ton truck is a, an actual truck. And, and basically, what normally happens is you have a base package, which is grip and support stuff. And then you start adding stuff to that vehicle, and that's where your additional charge starts to come in. So for this particular job, we are traveling with a fair amount of equipment, myself and then also the DP and AC for the project. But that's mainly camera gear and a little bit of support for the Ronin S Steadicam rig. And then most of the other stuff we are sourcing locally. So I'm hiring a gaffer for seven full days, and they're coming with their one ton, which is going to have a base package of, you know, four by four floppies, uh, Apple boxes. It's going to come with, you know, your standard grip stuff. So Cardellini clamps, you're going to have a quacker clamp or two inside of there, uh, made for clamps. Um, uh, or Maffer, depending on how you want to say it. I say Maffer, you say Maffer. Potatoes, potatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. And, um, and then some diffusion, and then there'll be a six by in there. And then we added stuff. So we needed some additional light modification. We needed some additional um, 
uh, grip support, so extra stands, and, and that's also in the base package. So you've got X number of C stands in that package, X number of, um, you know, bags of dirt, sandbags, uh, stingers, and then what you do is you add to that. You say, oh, we need two more 4x4 four four floppy cutter solids. Uh, we need an extra frame this size. We need this type of diffusion. And then there's usually expendables on that as well. So things like black wrap and gaffer's tape and just sort of your normal stuff that you need to pull. And usually you pay for that uh, per usage, though you can also negotiate and just say, I want to be able to pull from that whenever we want and just come up with a, uh, a, a good job, Daniel, for booking your first commercial shoot. Um, and then you, you can figure out your rates and stuff. And then usually if you're renting, you want to be like, this is a seven day production. It's actually more than seven days with some prep and things, but it's a seven day actual production with most of the crew. And so what you want to do is if you're renting, you generally want a three day week. So, uh, that means that I'm going to get all of the equipment for seven days, but I'm going to be paying for three of the days at whatever rate we agree upon. And so that's also important to think about when you are getting your stuff together. So for this particular job, going back, rewind to the tripod systems, which are a pain in the ass to travel with, we have two O'Connor 1030s with uh, good sticks. So those are 100 mil. Those will be uh, beefy enough to handle the shoulder mounted rig that I'm bringing for one of the C200s. Because when you build that out, you've got a VCT base plate. You've got all the other GAC. You're flying a monitor off of there and all of that stuff. So you need to have something that's you know generally sitting in at least the 30 pound limit to be able to balance something like that kind of rig uh, easily. So yes, I will explain how that three day week works. So usually when you rent equipment for one or two days, you go to a rental house and you say, I'd like this, 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 and this. And they say, okay, it's gonna cost you this much and they send you a quote and you say, uh, okay, or you don't and you say, hey, can you work on those numbers a little bit? And generally, because the rental market is pretty competitive, at least in major markets, they will come back and say, okay, I can give you 20% off or 25% off. And you can usually negotiate your rental rate when you get that first quote. So don't think that you can't, you can. Um, but the other thing is that there are some things that you can do when you are renting for longer periods of time, which are pretty standard, at least here in the United States. The first one is weekend rentals. Sometimes what you can do is pick up on a Friday and return on a Monday, and you get that for a one-day rental. Uh, the second one, which is very, very common, is what I'm doing in Atlanta, which is called a three-day week. So you're paying for three days for whatever equipment is on that list, but you're getting to keep it for seven days. So you're getting seven days for the price of three, and then it's also somewhat common to get what's called a one week month. So you rent for a full seven days and then you get it for the month because it's all just numbers when it comes to the rental. Uh, a rental house makes an investment in a piece of equipment and they have to set a price point at that piece of equipment, which you can negotiate, and they have to figure that it's gonna take X number of rental days for them to make that money back and to start making a profit on their investment. Now, obviously the investment into an Alexa or an Alexa Mini or a Venice uh, or a Red Monstro is a much larger investment, but of course you're also going to have a much higher day rate when it comes to that kind of stuff. So uh, hopefully Masterstroke Media, that explains what a three-day week is and how it works and ask for it. If you need equipment for more than three days, get it for a three-day week. And one of the great things about that is if you're going into a production and let's say you have four or five days of production, if you go into a three-day week, you could get that equipment a couple of days before your production and you can do a proper prep and you can actually do some test shooting and all that kind of stuff and get that going, uh, blah, 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 blah. Have you come to your senses and decided to move back to the East Coast yet? Alex says, how is Oregon work-wise so far? Seems like a backwards move for production in some ways. Thanks for uh, the great live stream. Uh, or street, live street. Uh, Alex, I am not moving back to the East Coast anytime soon. And uh, we moved to Oregon and to the West Coast for a number of reasons. Um, but quality of life was definitely one of them. And we are finding that after about two years that it is definitely a better quality of life. Um, I keep coming back to the East Coast for work and I will continue to do so. And I love the East Coast. But I think in terms of 
where I'm living, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, it's going to be there. I could see that a place like Oregon would be a step backwards, though there is a strong filmmaking community uh, out there. And then you have the OMPA, which is the uh, Oregon Media Production Association, which I'm a member of and involved with. And they are a great group. And there's uh, some incentives in Oregon. And there's a fair amount of production that goes on there in that town. And uh, actually, Portland is one of two uh, hubs in the world for animation. So some of the best, uh, like Leica stuff, comes out of there. And there's a whole bunch of other animation shops. So there's a community there and some other cool companies. You've got Lens Baby. You've got uh, Lettuce and a few other companies that are in our industry there. And while it is a big, I'd say, ad agency town because of Nike and because of um, Adidas, and then you also have companies like Intel, um, it's a great place. And for me, it's not really backwards because my lane is kind of the gem lane, the C47 lane. And for me, it doesn't seem to be a huge step backwards. Um, it may have affected some of my local work that I was doing for some of the companies, but I think overall, when I look back on the last two years, um, it hasn't had a, a hugely negative effect. But one of the things that I did when we decided to move out west, it was a long process to find a house and everything else, is I didn't just move and then tell people that I've worked with in the past that I had moved. I told them that we were planning to move for the better part of a year and a half to two years. So it wasn't a surprise. And I continued to do work with companies. And I think that maybe that was good for me to do that. Um, any last questions here? I think we're going to keep it to 45 minutes because I am going to get some more coffee, start to plan out this day and try to get over to the pool uh, before I have to come back for Cameron Flass later on. While everybody's here, by the way, um, uh, I wanted to say that uh, we are doing Cameron Flats today, our least favorite gear. That's myself, Ben Barden, and Caleb Pike. So that will be at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 p.m. British Summer Time, and midnight for check time. We'll call it check time, Ben time. Um, <laughs> so there you go. And then we're doing it this week, but next week I'm going to be on this production in Atlanta. We're going to be on location. I'm going to have about 35 people, 30, 35 people that I'm going to be dealing with. So I am not going to be able to do Gearbox next week or uh, Cameron Flask, but then we'll be back on July 3rd and back as always. Um, hopefully you guys learned something. Hey from LA, D Tech Logic. Uh, thanks for coming by. I've seen you before. And hopefully there's some edumacation. Check out that Access 20L bag. There's a link to it in the description. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you don't already. The more people that subscribe, the more I can create in terms of free educational content for you. Impart some knowledge if I can. Um, and then can I recommend a, uh, a Strang? Stereo mic strange. We're called a small band. Look, stereo mics from Rode are actually very good, and they have uh, some very cost-effective options. Or you can get a sound person and get two mono mics and just get the right mount and cross them. And uh, if they're a match pair, like the NT55s or something, that's stereo mic. Um, you just have to have the right angle. I'm not an expert on that, but I would say if you want a true stereo mic, then check out some of the solutions from Rode microphones. I'm not familiar with any other ones, but they are very cost effective and uh, seem to be working well. Um, would you say it's a good idea to rent cameras I'm interested in buying? I would, David. Um, I think you really have to spend a lot of time doing research first. And then again, you can take advantage of something like a three day week so that you can have a whole week to evaluate that and negotiate. Negotiate that rate down. You're welcome, John. Um, and there you go. We're wrapping it up. 45 minutes on this episode of Gearbox. I appreciate everybody watching. And I need more coffee. Uh, Clay, you are welcome. And we are, um, you know, going to keep doing these things. And again, I will be back with Gearbox. Probably a live stream, though. I am so backlogged. I have to create content for you guys. Like real content. 
maybe a little sexier than what I'm doing on the live streams that talks about some of the products that I am uh, interested in and also using in my production. I'm going to leave this weird, well, I'm going to have to break down this weird setup that I showed you at the beginning of this episode with the garbage can tripod until later on because when they come in to clean the room and they see this, they're going to be like, WTF, I don't know what to do. Uh, have a nice day. We are Cinema, Masterstroke Media, Daniel, uh, Wichita, Kansas. Never been there. Um, watch out for those tornadoes in the flatland. I will talk to you guys later, and thank you so much for watching. Uh, heading out for a few hours, and then join me with Caleb Pike and Ben Barden for Camera and Flask. Subscribe, all that good stuff. See you guys later on the next episode of Gearbox.